นี้ก่อนที่เราจะเข้าช่วงของแมนเดียนอย่างเป็นทางการนะคะวิทยากรของเราพร้อมแล้วและท่านมีสิ่งเพิ่มเติมที่น่าจะเป็นประโยชน์แก่ผู้ชมนะคะเตรียมมาให้ท่านรับชมก่อนเข้าเวลา14อ่ะขอภัยค่ะ13นาฬิกานะคะ so right now we have additional 10 minutes before the session from Mandiant I would like to welcome Mr. Uh, Steve Lessin from Mandiant he has an additional materials additional content for all the audience right now ค่ะ Welcome, Mr. Steve. Thank you so much, and thanks yeah. to everyone at NCSA. I figured uh, if we, while we have 10 minutes to go, uh, maybe use this time and, and share something. This is something I've shown in a lot of events that has got a lot of interest, and I thought maybe it would be interesting to spend 10 minutes and share this with you now. This is a, a model for thinking about cyber attacks, and uh, it's any type of cyber attack, whether it be cyber crime or cyber espionage. And it, it ties together a lot of the things that we talk about in cybersecurity. So let me walk you through it in the next 10 minutes. What I want you to focus on, on is the six circles. These are the six stages of attacks. Attacks don't happen all at once. They're broken into pieces. And so the first stage is an attacker will do an uh, initial reconnaissance on the victim. They'll study the victim. They then break into the victim with initial compromise, establishing a foothold so they can reliably get in. They then steal passwords and use those passwords to escalate the privileges. They then map out the internal network doing internal reconnaissance, move laterally across that network, maintaining persistence along the way. And they may iterate through that a, a number of times before they ultimately complete their mission. Right? So almost every cyber attack is going to follow these stages. And when we say the word breach, where does the breach happen? The breach happens in stage two, initial compromise. Uh, to the left-hand side of the breach, the attacker is not inside your network. And to the right-hand side of the breach, the attacker is inside your network. And the breach is instantaneous. Either the attacker is in or out. And a lot of organizations make the mistake of thinking that once they have the breach, there's impact. If I get breached, I've already lost, the hacker is already won, and there's nothing left to do. And so we better prevent that breach at all costs. Actually, the impact doesn't happen at the time of the breach. The impact happens at the end when the attacker completes the mission. And so yes, prevention is important, but there's also a second window of opportunity to stop the attacker even after you're breached, but before there's impact. Why does it happen this way? Why are there these additional stages? Why is the breach not enough? Well, most breaches, as we heard earlier today, happen through email. And when that initial compromise happens, the attacker lands on a machine that's being used to read email. And usually those machines that are reading email are not very important machines. They're laptops and workstations. The attacker wants to get over to the server. So these additional four stages are the process of moving from that initially compromised laptop over to the server. Now, as we said, before the breach, we want to prevent that breach from happening as best we can. But I think we all know in 2021, prevention is not 100%. There is, there is no silver bullet to stop all attackers. And so while prevention works a lot of the time, sometimes there'll be prevention failures. And when prevention fails, you want to respond to those prevention failures. And the idea is you want to minimize the amount of dwell time, the, the amount of time the attacker has in the network before they're discovered. And of course, you have to discover them before you can respond to them. Now, we have this idea of detection. And detection, we can use many different ways. On the prevention side, we're talking about detecting the threat we want to prevent. But on the response side, we're actually detecting something different. What we're detecting is a compromise, an intrusion, a prevention failure an attacker that's already inside the network. And this is the whole idea behind, as I'm sure you heard, detection and response, right? It's complementary to prevention. And largely the prevention problem is really a malware problem. A lot of those in initial intrusions, the initial compromise, it's through malware that comes in through email, either an attachment or a malicious link. But once the attacker has breached the organization, once they're inside, once they've defeated prevention, it changes from a malware problem 
to a human attacker problem. And what I mean by that is they're using the living off the land techniques that we talked about earlier. Those aren't malware. They're using stolen passwords. Those aren't malware. So we're looking for malware typically before the breach, but we're looking for hacking activity by a human after the breach. A lot of times on the prevention side, we consider this to be north-south traffic or the traffic between the internet and our organization. On the response side, aligned to lateral movement, it's east-west traffic. It's, it's traffic between the end user network segment and the server network segment. For network security controls, our intrusion prevention systems are very much uh, guarding the perimeter. Uh, and there's new technology like NDR or network detection and response that's looking for these later stages. And in fact, the stages are called post exploitation or post compromise stages, right? And so that's what detection and response will largely focus on. Then you've got endpoint security controls, EPP or endpoint prevention platform and EDR, endpoint detection and response. Yeah, and EPP is about preventing malware. EDR is about responding to the human. EDR isn't so much antivirus 2.0. Yes, some, some vendors converge EPP and EDR into one solution, but EDR by itself isn't so much about malware. It's about detecting and responding to the human intrusion, the prevention failure in your network. Typically, that's not going to have a lot to do with malware. Threat intelligence aligns to this as well. Tactical threat intelligence, that's the IOCs, the URLs, the hashes, domain names, all of the things that we feed into our prevention technology to help make them block more malware. But on the response side, we shift to operational threat intelligence. Those are more the TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that the human attacker uses once they're in the victim network. We can align roughly SIM and XDR to this as well, just like we put, um, uh, put the technologies on the before the breach side, the prevention technologies, and XDR on more investigation. Now, SIM, of course, doesn't prevent anything, but maybe it does the first step of detection. XDR is much more focused on the investigation and the response side. And then there's MSSPs and MDR as well. Uh, managed security service providers will typically alert when you have a problem, but usually they don't help you to investigate. Managed detection and response answers the question, what is the human doing? What is the intruder doing? Um, how do we intercept them? How do we stop them before there's impact? You can think of pen tests and red teams this way as well. Pen test is all about can I intrude into the network? Can I achieve initial compromise? But a red team goes further. It's not just can I break into the network? Can I penetrate into the network? It is can I complete the mission? Can I impact the business? If it's a bank doing a red team, for example, it might be um, you know, can, a, can the attacker, can the red team transfer money from one account to another? And then we bucket the evidence. Uh, Mandian is an organization that responds to thousands of cyber attacks. And uh, for each of these stages, we said, when we investigate, let's bucket the evidence in each stage and see how full each bucket is. And so initial compromise, the bucket is 9% of breach evidence lives in the initial compromise stage. Established foothold is 18%, escalate privilege 7%, internal reconnaissance and lateral movement, 52%, and complete mission, 14%. If you add those all together, the post-exploitation stages, 91% of the evidence of a breach is in the post-exploitation stages. And so this is why it's really important to have both prevention and detection response working together so that you can be cyber resilient so that you can survive a prevention failure, so that you can survive an intrusion and not have business impact. So I hope that that's a model that's interesting for you and puts some of the pieces together in a way that's easy to think about. With that, I'll, I'll hand back um, to Eva. Thank you so much. Okay, I think that is a great introduction before we jump right into your topic. 
right? Will you be sharing that slide um, to add it as an additional materials for people sure. joining? Sure, we can share that slide as additional materials, no problem. Thank you so much, Ka. Thank you. Okay, so let me properly introduce you again and let me introduce the section from Mandian again. Okay, so now uh, we have Mr. Steve Lessin, the CEO from Man, uh, sorry, CTO from Mandian, who will also like uh, present us the topic of no ransomware before they know you. And also after the presentation, there will also be a Q&A section, which is going to be a little bit more special, which is going to be special too, right, Mr. Steve? Yes. Okay, so we will select some questions from the audience. And if uh, Mr. Uh, Steve lets in select which questions is the best, those, pers those people might win something from Mandian today as well. Okay, so let me uh, give the stage to uh, Kun Steve lets in on the topic of no ransomware before they know you. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen again. Okay. So um, now we'll get into the ransomware topic, and it does, it, it ties very closely into what we just talked about with the attack lifecycle. Um, before we begin, though, I just have one small housekeeping item uh, to cover by sharing this disclaimer. Uh, folks often ask us if, if we at Mandian can talk about our customers so that they can relate those stories to their own situations. Unfortunately, the answer is no. Uh, we take every precaution to preserve the confidentiality of our customers. In fact, as shown on this slide, uh, some facts have been changed to obscure customer identities, and I'll give you just a, a few seconds to review this slide. Okay. Uh, during this presentation, I will uh, pull the audience a few times as well. So if you can have your cell phone nearby uh, a couple times throughout the presentation, we'll share some QR codes. And I know we've got close to uh, you know, uh, hundreds of people on this call. And so um, we can pull the audience and see what the audience thinks in aggregate. That should be fun and interesting. Okay, uh, this is what I'd like to talk about. I'd like to introduce Mandiant to you in case you've not heard of Mandiant before so you can understand what Mandiant's about. We'll then talk about ransomware. I know there was a, a very good ransomware presentation earlier in the day and I'll try and talk about different topics so that we don't uh, duplicate any of the content there. We'll talk about the evolutions of ransomware um, over time and what are the things you really need to understand uh, the, the, the changes to anticipate how to avoid being a victim, and if you are a victim, how to respond properly. Then I'll focus a little bit specifically on ransomware in Thailand, and then we'll close with some recommendations. Okay, so let me introduce Mandiant to you, in case you've not heard of them. So at Mandiant, we've long said that intrusions are inevitable, right? That line, that breach that we showed there will be prevention failures. So there's always someone in the organization who will accidentally click on something that they probably shouldn't. And that's all that's needed for an attacker to be successful to get into that victim organization. And in fact, the modern security thinking with zero trust has this principal tenant of assume breach, right? Assume, and what that means is assume prevention will fail. But that doesn't mean assume impact. Right? The impact happens later, but you need to expect that prevention will fail from time to time and there will be intrusions. And the reason that's so important is today when prevention fails, it's very commonly the case that no one notices. And so no one tries to intercept, no one tries to respond because they don't know the intrusion even happened. So we need to expect that intrusion, we need to be looking for it. And when companies have these intrusions, they have more questions then they do answers. Imagine you just got the news that an intruder is in your network. What will the business want to know? They'll want to know what did the attackers steal? How long have the attackers been inside without you knowing? How did the attackers get in in the first place? What sort of data do the attackers have access to? What sort of accounts are any of them administrator accounts? Who is this attacker and what are they trying to do? What is their motivation and how do we kick them out? And if you don't have the answers to those questions, you can't respond. Right? You need to understand what is happening 
before you can decide what to do about it. And that is what Mandiant is all about. Mandiant gets the answers to those urgent business questions quickly in a time of crisis. And we call that incident response. We've been doing that for close to two decades now. And that has led us to have a wealth of experience understanding attack groups and how they operate. We respond to close to a thousand breaches a year. That's about three times a day. Someone calls up Mandian and says, help, I've been the victim of a cyber attack. I need to understand what happened and I need to understand what to do about it. And we do a lot more than just respond to breaches. We have proactive consultancy services. We have uh, security um, as a service platform and, and, and many components. But the experience that we have, a great portion of it comes from responding to these breaches. And many of the headline breaches that you've seen in the news, more times than not, it'll be Mandiant, who's been hired by that company to go and answer those questions. So that, that is Mandiant in a nutshell. Now, when it comes to ransomware, this year alone, we've responded to hundreds of ransomware victims. And these situations are very, very bad situations. The, Organization is in crisis, the business is impacted. In some cases, the business's customers are impacted. In many cases, there's headline news naming the company in the breach. In many cases in the US, those companies and their executives have been called to testify to the government so the government can understand what happened in that breach and so that they can try and generate legislation to try and prevent it from happening again. A lot of times there's brand reputation damage. A lot of times the CEO is directly involved because there's so much business impact uh, that, it, that the decisions that need to be taken are at a CEO level. These companies are under extreme time pressure. When ransomware strikes, there's a time limit. And so they need the answers to those questions quickly. And the consequences of making the wrong decision can be very high. And often these victims are completely outgunned. And what I mean by that is that the attacker who's attacking them has been in hundreds of fights, hundreds of cyber battles. But the victim, this is their first fight. And so in terms of experience, there's a mismatch. And so Mandian comes in in this very high crisis situation while there's an active cyber attack going on. And we help to balance that equation. We bring our expertise and experience and we, uh, we generate the best outcome possible for our clients in these types of ransomware situations. So it's, in, it's from this experience that I wanna share with you today the learnings and the evolution of ransomware. In fact, ransomware has changed so much that we don't like to call it ransomware anymore. Uh, we, we like to call it multifaceted extortion. And I'll explain why we think a name change is necessary a little bit later in the presentation. When we think of ransomware, maybe this is what we think of. We think of a malware that comes on to our computer or maybe a set of computers. It executes, it encrypts files, making those files inaccessible, and it causes some pain and, uh, and uh, discomfort for the organization, certainly for the individual whose computer that may be. That was the ransomware of two or three years ago. What's happened now is the attackers who were already very technically savvy, those attackers are becoming more business savvy. This old style ransomware, the attackers were only asking for a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of dollars. This is not what's happening today. What's happening today looks more like this. The attackers have figured out what are the pain points for businesses and they get leverage underneath those pain points and not just one, but multiple pain points. And they press against all of those pain points all at the same time to try and cause as much impact to their victims as possible to increase the likelihood that that victim will pay the ransom. No organization wants to pay a ransom but many organizations have found themselves in a situation where they feel like they have no choice because the leverage being used against them is so high. Let's look at some of these. So we still have ransomware encryption uh, is still part of multifaceted extortion. We see that now, uh, not just 
impacting the desktops, like we saw on the earlier session I showed you, the initial compromise. Uh, we see the ransomware now hitting servers. So there's a full intrusion happening. We see uh, the ransomware encryptions happening on OT networks. These are physical cyber network or physical networks uh, that can cause even more disruption and impact. We see data theft happening as part of multifaceted extortion. And that could be intellectual property. It could be personal information. We see shaming happening, uh, outing of the victims when they lose the data by the attacker. We see distributed denial of service being factored in and a number of other evolutions as well. I'll stop, I'll walk you through these one at a time, but I wanted to give you a picture of just how much multifaceted extortion has evolved beyond just the original ransomware. So let's do our first polling. Um, if you have your phone nearby you, you can snap this QR code. Uh, It'll just take you to a web page. You don't need to install any software. You don't need to log in. You don't need to set up an account. It's, it's just a web page and you can vote, click submit, and you're done. And then we will see the results in aggregate on what the audience thinks the answer is. And there's no identification of anyone, no usernames or anything like that, just, just the results in a pie chart. Okay. So the question is, what is the largest ransomware payout to date? And the payout is the, the key word there. This is a victim that was attacked by ransomware and they decided to pay the ransom. Is it 4.4 million US dollars? Is it 11 million US dollars? Is it 40 million US dollars? 70 million US dollars? Or whopping 600 million US dollars? It's the largest ransomware payout to date. Hopefully you've snapped that code. Let me uh, come to the results and see what the audience is saying. Okay, okay we do only have- get, Do you get enough responses? Yeah, so we have 11 so far. So I'm gonna bring okay. the QR code back because uh, I know we have many more than 11 people on the, <laughs> on the, uh, on the bridge. Uh, sure. So I'll give you a little bit more time to snap the code, it'll just take you to the web page. Just oh. choose which one of these. And by the way, all five of these numbers, they're all real numbers in some way related to cyber attacks. But only one of the answers is the correct answer. And that is the largest ransomware payout to date. Okay, let the me five. give you like, uh, let me give the audience some brief explanation in Thai so that they can, some of them can participate too. That would be great. ในเคสของแรนซัมแวร์มากที่สุดที่เหยื่อต้องจ่ายเป็นค่าแรนซัมแวร์มากที่สุดนะคะพอท่านสแกน QR code ไปไม่ต้องติดตั้งอะไรทั้งสิ้นเลยเขาก็จะเป็น choice เนี่ยแหละให้คุณเลือกคำตอบแล้วเดี๋ยวเราจะมาดูโพลกันว่าเดาเราเดากันนะคะว่ามากที่สุดเนี่ยเท่าไหร่ที่เคยจ่ายกันมาโอเค All right let's come back up we're coming Ooh, up to 78 more answers <laughs> Yeah we'll give it another another 30 seconds or so Sure okay another 30 seconds <laughs> นะคะมีอีกนะคะแล้วก็คุณ Steve เองพูดว่าตัวเลขเหล่านี้เนี่ยเป็นตัวเลขจริงนะคะis that 30 second now? That's good. <laughs> okay. okay, we're up to 126. So we broke 100. Let's take a look at what people are saying. So here are the results and the results are still coming in. So 12 people think $4.4 .4 million is the largest amount. Uh, seven people are saying $11 million is the largest amount. We've got 42 people saying 40 million. We've got very close. 40 people saying 70 million, and we've got 36 people saying 600 million. So let me walk through the answers. Um, $4.4 million was an attack that happened this year that was paid out. I'm sure all of you uh, have seen it on the news. It was a high profile attack, uh, but it was not the largest payout to date. So uh, 4.4 million was paid out, but we're looking for the largest payout. $11 million uh, was also an attack this year, and it was also paid out, but it also was not the largest ransomware payout. 
40 million dollars the majority of the audience called it correctly so congratulations to the audience 40 million dollars is the correct answer for the largest ransomware payout to date the 70 million dollars was a ransomware demand so a uh, organization got hit by ransomware and the threat actor asked for 70 million but that 70 million wasn't paid and the 600 million was a cyber attack but it was not a ransomware attack. It was an attack against a cryptocurrency uh, brokerage. And so um, that was a, a real attack, but not a ransomware attack. So congratulations to the 48 or 49 people now who have said 40 million, that's, that's the correct answer. Okay, please continue. Thank you. We'll have two more poll questions, so you'll have two more chances uh, a little bit later on in the presentation, so keep your cell phones nearby. So let's talk about how ransomware evolved into multifaceted extortion. And the first evolution is what we call post-compromise ransomware. Now this should remind you of the attack lifecycle we talked about earlier, right? Um, post-compromise or post-exploitation stages. The old way of doing ransomware was to email the ransomware. Someone would open it and where would the ransomware take effect? It would take effect on the machine that was being used to read email, which is a low value machine. And attackers can't demand a lot of money for those types of machines. Those types of spam, those types of ransomware look very much like spam. They were shotgun approach. The new type of ransomware is post compromise. Instead of emailing in ransomware, they email in a backdoor so that the hacker can hack into the network, achieve a initial compromise. And then they follow all of the other stages, the um, established foothold, the escalate privilege, the lateral movement, and the complete mission, because they want to do that to get onto the servers. Because if they can deploy the ransomware on the servers, they can ask for a lot more money. The problem for the attacker is that no one reads email on the servers. So you can't just email the ransomware to the server. They have to break into the network, hack into the network, move over to the servers and manually deploy the ransomware on the servers. Then they can ask for a higher value return. It requires an intrusion. It requires a prevention failure. And so this is what we mean by post compromise ransomware. And why that's important to understand is because people ask, well, how do I defend against ransomware? And, and you don't want to think about ransomware defense as malware defense. You want to think about it as that human-based intrusion. Remember, in the post-exploitation stages, the later four stages, there's not a lot of malware. All of that is happening before the ransomware gets deployed. So you want to think of ransomware as a human intrusion problem more than as a malware problem. This is how the ransomware actors operate. Step one is to break into the network. Step two is to find the important data. Step three is to encrypt that important data with ransomware. And step four is to demand a ransom payment to restore the data. Now, if we try and address this problem as a malware, the malware only comes in step three. So you're telling the attacker, I'll give you step one and step two for free. I'm only going to stop the malware. That's not a good approach. We want to stop the intrusion that comes before the ransomware. That is the best way to stop multifaceted extortion today. There's a really interesting component of post-compromise ransomware. And that is with the old ransomware, when they just emailed the ransomware in, when did the ransomware execute? It executed whenever the person opened the attachment in the email. The attacker didn't control that. That could happen on a Tuesday, it could happen at three o'clock, it could happen whenever they're reading email. And so the attacker didn't control the timing of the attack. But with post-compromise ransomware, it's different. The attacker is in the network. They are the one pulling the trigger on the ransomware infecting the servers. They do control the timing. So when do you think they choose that timing to be? They choose it to be at the most inconvenient time for the victim, which is going to be evening hours, weekend hours, or probably even a holiday weekend. They don't want people around to be able to make decisions. They don't want people around to be able to fix things. 
They want to attack in off hours. And that's one of the advantages when they move to post-compromise ransomware. Okay, here's our second polling question. Same rules as last time. The QR code will just take you to a website where you can vote again. And the question this time is, if I have frequent, reliable, tested, and offline backups, I'm reasonably protected against ransomware attacks. Is that true or false? Right? And so we've got a lot of qualifiers there. The backups are happening often, frequently. The backups are in a good state, they're reliable, and they're tested. And the backups are offline, they're off network. Is that a reasonable protection against ransomware today? Okay, let me help translate that for some people. นะคะอันนี้เป็นร่วมสนุกการตอบว่าถูกหรือผิด true or false นะคะว่าถ้าเราเนี่ยมีระบบ backup offline ที่ไว้ใจได้น้องปลอดภัยแล้วเรา backup บ่อยๆนะคะถือว่าเรานั้นมีวิธีป้องกัน ransomware ที่โอเคแล้วหรือเปล่าอ่านะคะสแกน QR code เพื่อไปเลือกคำตอบได้เลยลองเดาซิว่า backup ก็แล้วระบบ backup ก็ดีใช้ได้ไหมนะคะ Okay. Let's How take many a seconds? Look. Oh, okay. We have already. <laughs> no, got no, some no. This is this this is the last one. Uh, let, let me change over to the other tab here. So we've got fifty six, fifty seven. Let's give it a few more seconds. Maybe ten more seconds. Okay. Well, ค่ะสิบวินาทีลองเล่นสนุกกันดูนะคะว่าเออเนี่ยเราเคยได้ยินมาว่าต้องแบ็กอัพจะโดนแรนซัมแวร์ต้องแบ็กอัพจะได้ไม่ต้องจ่ายค่าถ่ายมีระบบที่ดีแล้วป้องกันเราได้จริงหรือเปล่านะคะ True or false? Okay, let's take a look at the answers. We're up at 80, and if we look at the results, wow, so it's pretty divided. We've got 37 people saying true, and we've got 51 people saying false. This is an important question. I would, say, I would say if you asked this question two years ago, the answer would be true. But if you ask the question today, the answer probably is false. So again, the majority of the audience, I, I think I agree with. And so why? Why is it false? Why are frequent, reliable, tested, offline backups not enough? The reason is the second evolution of multifaceted extortion. Attackers now are adding data theft to the mix. So what, is, what does that mean? Remember the flow. The attacker breaks into the network. They find the important data on the servers. They encrypt that important data with ransomware, and then they demand the ransom payment. Well, step one and two, it's a lot of work to break into the network, to move across all those attack stages, to get onto the servers, to steal the passwords, and to install the ransomware. And they say, We're on, we've just finished step two. We're about to do step three. Why don't we add another step? And that step is we're on the server with the important data. Why don't we also just steal that data while we're here? And the stealing of the data is not so that they can sell it, sometimes, but usually not. The reason they steal that data is because they want to add another point of leverage and pain for the victim. They threaten to make that stolen data public. So imagine if this is customer information, or imagine this is business plans, or imagine this is even uh, HR payroll, right? How would the business feel? to have that data in the hands of the attacker, and the attacker says, I'm going to publish your business data on a website for all the world to see unless you pay the ransom. So the reason the answer is false, the reason why reliable backups aren't enough today is because attackers do this. Attackers, uh, are, backups are good at fixing the problem of encrypted files, but backups are not good at solving this problem, the problem of an attacker who's stolen your data and threatening to make it public. And this is by default what happens with ransomware today. If you get hit by ransomware, this is what you should expect to happen. So you need to think beyond just backups. Backups solve part of the problem, but with multifaceted extortion, they don't solve all the problem. In fact, the way you could think of business impact from ransomware is it used to be a service disruption. But ransomware today is a data breach. And a data breach brings 
all new business consequences. Remember, the attackers are becoming more business savvy. It brings all new business consequences, more painful consequences, depending on the organization for a lot of businesses. So I said that they will share that data. What are some of the things they do once they stole that data? Well, the next evolution is to use it for shaming, taunting, and coercion. So who do the attackers share the data with? Well, they can share the data with local news and media sources so that not only do they push it on a website, but it becomes very public. All the world will know that your company has lost data because it will be in the news because the attacker shares it with news sources. We've also seen attackers threaten to share that data with regulators so that now the regulators come and they add pressure. Sometimes some businesses may be more afraid of the regulators than the attackers. And so this is a way for the attackers to leverage that. We've seen cases, and I'll give you an example on the next slide, of the attackers threatening to share that stolen data with the victim's customers. And in the case of high tech, uh, the attackers may share that uh, stolen data with even competitors. We've seen them threaten to do that as well. Right? So this is now a whole new set of problems beyond my files are encrypted and I can't access them. Now it's also my sensitive private data is going to be shared with, with uh, publicly in a way I don't want it to be shared. Here's an example um, that you can find of uh, an attacker communicating with the victim's customers. And this happened of April of this year. And I'll just read to you the, the letter, the email on the left. Um, this is from the attacker to the victim's customers. It says, your personal data has been stolen and will be published. Good day. If you receive this letter, you are a customer, buyer, partner, or employee of the victim. This company has been hacked, data has been stolen, and will soon be released as the company refuses to protect its people's data. Now that sounds very righteous, but actually it's the attacker who stole the data in the first place. We inform you that information about you will be published on the dark net at this site if the company does not contact us, meaning if the company does not pay the ransom. Call or write to this store and ask to protect your privacy. So you see what the attacker is doing here. He's turning the victim's own customers against the victim to gain leverage to try and get that extortion payment made to the attacker. One of the key lessons here is that with multifaceted extortion, the attacker is in control of the breach disclosure, not the victim, right? The attacker decides whether or not the breach becomes public. So that's quite different than what a lot of organizations have experienced in the past. And it, it's an important consideration when you think about ransomware. And again, it's a problem that backups don't fix. Okay, the next evolution in multifaceted extortion is around insider recruiting. So if you remember, the attacker needs to achieve initial compromise. They can do that with email, they can do that by exploiting vulnerabilities, but there's a lower tech way of doing that, and that's by bribing employees, by recruiting insiders. So we heard about Lockbit earlier today, and uh, this is one of their communications to potential insiders that they would like to work with. Would you like to earn a million dollars? Launch the provided virus on any computer in your company. So that the attacker doesn't have to achieve initial compromise, they're paying someone to achieve it for them. We've seen attackers add DDoS as part of multifaceted extortion as well. This is an article from Mandiant Advantage Mandiant Advantage is Mandiant's SaaS platform, which provides intelligence, many other capabilities. Here we're tracking uh, Revil and uh, Soto no Kibi around uh, a capability they're advertising for DDoS for an extra fee as part of their extortion, right? So again, not just in, of encrypting files. 
And then another evolution is to maybe sell that data if the extortion fails. So this was quite recent as well. This is from uh, another uh, ransomware crew. They say, if you're a client who declined the deal, and what they mean by deal, you know, the, their language is very interesting here. By client, they mean victim, right? So if you're a victim who declined the deal, by deal, they mean declined to pay the ransom, right? So if you're a victim who declined to pay the ransom and did not find your data on the website where we publish stolen data or did not find the valuable files, this does not mean that we, the attackers, forgot about you. It means that the data was sold, sold and only therefore it did, get, did not get published in free access, right? So selling is still an option that's open to them, although the trend, uh, the more popular path seems to be publishing uh, or threatening to publish data and extorting, extorting victims that way. Another evolution is rebranding. And this one is really interesting as well. Uh, as organizations, as, as the attackers gain popularity, or I shouldn't say popularity, as, as they gain um, uh, recognition, too much of uh, being known is not good for them because it will attract law enforcement attention. And so when they become, when their name becomes too big, while that would be good for most legitimate businesses, that is not good for the ransomware crews. And so often what they do is if they become too big, they rebrand, they abandon their old name and they change to a new name. And, and that's an attempt to get under the radar of law enforcement in many cases. And so we can see a couple of examples from that on Bleeping Computer, uh, Dark Side Ransomware Gang returns its new Black Matter operation and Maze uh, Ransomware shutting down its cyber operation, but later spun up as Egregor um, Ransomware. And so we see this happening as well. Governments are getting serious though. Uh, just this very month, there's been some really interesting news uh, on, uh, on governments retaliating against these sort of attacks. So it's not all doom and gloom. It's not all bad news. Attacker or the governments, um, you can see on the left, uh, there were raids against uh, some of the operators of Revil. And uh, also in this month, the US Department of State started offering rewards, uh, quite substantial rewards, in this case, $10 million uh, for information leading to the identification of some of these ransomware organizations. So governments are getting more serious about it. And there was a really interesting comment. Every year, Mandiant has um, what we call our Cyber Defense Summit. We just had it uh, last month. Uh, and we share, of course, you know, our experience on the front lines. We have a number of uh, guests that come to present as well. One of uh, the guests that we had this year was General Nakasone out of the United States. He's the uh, commander of US Cyber, Com Cyber Command and also the director of the National Security Agency. Uh, this wasn't his first time at Cyber Defense Summit. This was uh, at least his second time. And so he made this comment uh, that I thought was really interesting. He said, when I was here two years ago, here being Cyber Defense Summit, when, when I was at Cyber Defense Summit two years ago, if someone asked me about ransomware, I would say that's criminal activity and the FBI handles ransomware, right? So essentially what he's saying is that is not a matter of, uh, uh, that, a, that a four-star general needs to concern himself with. It's not his problem. But then he said, but now when ransomware affects critical infrastructure, that's a national, a national security issue, right? And so that is my problem. That is something I'll concern myself with. And we're starting to see that countries now are recognizing that ransomware is beyond just criminal. Ransomware is a national security issue. And once you see ransomware or multifaceted extortion, as a national security issue, you can address it with the tools of national security. You have a, a larger tool set available to you. And, and this is where we are in November of 2021, where we're starting to see more of this happen.
And so that is a good, uh, some good news in light of all the attacks that we've been seeing um, over the last year or two with successful ransomware attacks. But what about locally in Thailand? Right? What does what multifaceted extortion look like in Thailand? Well, one of the things that Mandiant does is we have, uh, an, aside from incident response, we have an intelligence organization. Because we respond to all these threat actors, we have a wealth of information about who the attackers are, how they operate, their TTPs. So we have a very substantial intelligence capability as well. And we do what are called country snapshots, and we share these with our intelligence customers. And we did one for Thailand um, in Q3 of this year. And we look at the different types, the different motivations of cyber attacks, right? So there's hacktivism, there's information operations. Information operations you can think of as, uh, to put it in very simple terms, it's uh, like fake news done by governments to influence geopolitical um, considerations that are interests to their state. There's espionage, which is spying, and then there's cybercrime. And then across each one of these four cyber motivations, we assess how frequent or how common they are from zero to five, and what's the magnitude of impact from zero to five. And then we generate what we call a cyber threat score for the nation, right, for that specific quarter. So you can see overall, Thailand has a cyber threat score of 3.4, right? And so that's taking into consideration uh, all of the, the various aspects. And you can see that cyber crime is the motivation which is most frequent as well as most impactful in terms of magnitude for Thailand. So this is where ransomware lives. It lives in cyber crime. Well, can we get more specific than that? Yeah, I think we can. We can actually go and look at those shaming sites, the sites where companies have had their data stolen and threatened to be published or published by uh, the attackers. And you can see across the top, there's lots of ransomware crews. And across the left, we have dates. So we're looking at August, September, October, and November. And all of these are organizations that landed on one of those sites. Um, and, and they were organizations based in Thailand. And uh, so we didn't put the company names here. We just put their industry, uh, although the shaming sites have the company names. Uh, and you can see that, you know, there's quite a lot happening in Thailand. You might not see all of this in the news, but multifaceted extortion is a real problem for Thailand. And it's not just one crew. Lockbit, yes, more than others, but there are other crews that have victimized organizations in Thailand as well. And also, it's not just one industry. It's, it's a spread of industries. So what I think this slide really means is that everyone in Thailand needs to think carefully about multifaceted extortion, not just how to uh, prevent it, but also if you do get hit, how to respond to it. Okay, let's close up with some recommendations. So we talked about the threat. I hope I hope that was helpful in understanding all the aspects of multifaceted extortion. Now we come to the question of, well, what should we do about this problem? And I have a, a set of recommendations for you. Let's go to that first recommendation we talked about earlier with backups, right? So remember, this is what multifaceted extortion looks like. And if we say, where do backups help? The backups only help on the encryption piece, right? That solves the encryption problem. But the other aspects of multifaceted extortion are not solved by backups. And, and in some cases, those other aspects, those other points of leverage that the attacker is using could be more painful than the encryption itself. So what can we do? What can we add to making sure we have good backups? So the first is manage detection and response. So do you remember the, uh, the idea that an attacker will defeat prevention and, and there's a breach, there's an intrusion, but that is not the end goal. They still have a lot of work to do before they get onto the servers and deploy the ransomware on the servers, the post-compromise ransomware. Well, the, the problem with 
that is that organizations sometimes think if a hacker breaks into my network, it'll be like someone breaking into my house. I'll, I'll know right away if there's a break in. But the reality is when someone breaks into your network, it's often invisible. And, and so um, one of the things I want to I want to share with you is uh, this book. This was just released by Mandy and it's called the Deven Defenders Advantage. It's a free book that you can download in any e book. It's uh, the QR code is on the screen. And, and there's this quote in the book in the introduction that says with multifaceted extortion and ransomware, a successful network intrusion precedes the manual ransomware deployment. Organizations need to shift left, and by shift left, that means move left in the attack life cycle. Catch the attack earlier in the attack life cycle, in the left-hand stages of the attack life cycle. Catch the attack at its earliest stages. It's less about catching the attacker's malicious payload and more about catching the intrusion that precedes that payload deployment. Well, I was, as I was saying, an intrusion in your home is very noticeable. An intrusion in your network, often not noticeable. And so this is the last polling question I would like to ask you. Uh, this is for organizations in Asia Pacific and Japan. How long does it take the average victim of an intrusion to notice that intrusion? So from the time the attacker breaks in, from the time the attacker defeats prevention and is inside the network, how long before someone notices? And of course, you can't respond until you notice the intrusion. So on average, does it take one day to notice? On average, does it take six days to notice the intrusion? 13 days to notice the intrusion? Or 76 days to notice the intrusion? Uh, maybe we can get some help and, and sure. share on this question also. Of course, of course. นะคะสำหรับการเล่นสนุกช่วงนี้เนาะให้เราทายกันว่าโดยเฉลี่ยแล้วนะคะมีคนเจาะระบบเข้ามานานขนาดไหนกว่าที่ผู้ถูกเจาะหรือว่าเหยื่อเนี่ยจะรู้ตัวนะคะอ่ะในหนึ่งวันก็รู้แล้วหรือว่าเจาะเข้ามา6วันแล้วถึงจะรู้หรือ13วันหรือ76วันนะคะลองสแกน QR code นี้แล้วก็ตอบคำถามดูค่ะ okay. right. so thank you so again so from the time of intrusion to the time someone notices that intrusion how long does that take let's come to the third poll and refresh and see how many responses we have uh, 61 maybe we can give it another 10 or 15 seconds โอเคนะคะว่าเจาะระบบเข้ามาแล้วกี่วันถึงจะรู้ตัวโดยโดยประมาณนะคะหนึ่งวัน6วัน13วันหรือ76วันค่ะโอเค is that 10 seconds yeah I think we're good we're we're up close to 80 so let's see what people are saying wow it's quite quite evenly split here so a few people nine people saying one day but most of the audience is split between the the later three options Uh, so we've got 20 people saying it takes six days to notice the intrusion. We've got 30 people saying it takes 13 days, almost two weeks, to notice the intrusion. And we have uh, 33 people saying it takes the full 76 days, more than two months, to notice the intrusion. So once again, the, the audience is right. 34 people in the audience correctly called it. It actually takes 76 days. Is the average, and that's not a survey number. That's a measured number. Remember, Mandy responds to intrusions and it responds to victims of cyber attack. And every time we respond to a, a victim, they have this question: How long were they inside our network without us knowing? And so we measure it. We know what time they were discovered, and we forensically determine the time of intrusion, and we subtract the two. And for every victim we help, we average that over the course of the year. So this is our own measured data in Asia Pacific. And the answer is 76 days, two months. That's a big problem. Anyone want to take a guess at how long it takes the ransomware actor from the time they intrude? How long, remember, they have some work to do to get over to the servers. How long does that work take 
from the time the attacker defeats prevention to the time they get on the server and pull the trigger and deploy the ransomware, that's just five days. So you see the problem, right? The, the attacker is done in five days. The defenders, no one even knows anything is wrong for two months, right? And so that's why we're seeing ransomware happen time and time and time again, seeing so many victims in the news for ransomware. It's not that they got hit by ransomware. It's that there was an intrusion in their network that they did not notice that allowed the attacker to do some work and deploy the ransomware on the server. If we can take that 76 days and we can reduce it to something smaller so that we can notice the intrusion more quickly, so that we can notice the prevention failure more quickly, then maybe we can intercept the attacker and stop the attacker before they make it to the servers. That idea is the idea of managed detection and response, MDR uh, term uh, that Gartner uses. It is the idea of noticing prevention failures quickly, much more quickly than 76 days. Mandiant has a MDR service that we call managed defense, and we measure how long it takes our service to notice, our clients. We take that 76 days and we bring it not down to two days, we bring it down to two hours. So we have had many experiences in managed defense where we have seen our customers using prevention from many, many different vendors and all of that prevention fails and the attacker gets inside. We notice that within two hours, we intercept the attacker and we kick them out of the network before they can get onto the servers and before they can deploy the ransomware. That is detection and response, right? And, and MDR is doing that as a managed outsourced service. I can't think of any value that you get that is greater in cybersecurity than taking a 76 day dwell time, 76 days to notice and reducing that down to a few hours, right? That is not just gonna help with ransomware. That's gonna help with any type of intrusion, espionage intrusion, right? Any sort of hacking where an attacker breaks in, manage detection and response will, uh, is working to find. So this is a great capability to, uh, to have to uh, respond to ransomware threats. And think for your own organization. Do you, does your organization measure this dwell time metric from time of intrusion to time of discovery? Okay, another important recommendation is something called a ransomware defense assessment. Okay. This is a service, think of it like a consultancy service takes around three to four weeks. It's very flexible depending on how you configure it. Can be done on premise, can be done remotely. And it, it, yes, it looks at your security architecture to see how resilient you are against uh, ransomware, but it, it doesn't stop there. It also says if the worst happens and if you're a victim of ransomware and an attacker is threatening to publish your sensitive data, in the next 24 hours, unless you pay them a million dollars, how is your business going to handle that? First of all, who can make the decision on the payment? Is it an individual? Is it a committee? Is it the CEO? Is it the, does the board have to um, approve? And so you need to think of these aspects ahead of time because in a real crisis, the clock is ticking and you don't have time to think things out for the first time. You need to plan ahead. The ransomware defense assessment helps you plan from a business perspective ahead, not just in terms of communications, but also in terms of response and recovery. Will you get a negotiator to negotiate with the, with the uh, threat actor? How will you do recovery? If there's hundreds of servers that have been encrypted, how are you going to restore if you choose not to pay? Uh, yes, you may have good backups, but how long does it take to restore those backups of 100 servers? And how, how much will that cost your business? 
Do you have people ready to come and help you so that you can parallelize those restores and get back up and running more quickly? Right? So there's things to think of beyond just the ransomware itself from business consideration. The ransomware defense assessment can help you to do it. This is a great way to prepare to be resilient, right? So resilient, the way I define resilient is prevention plus detection and response, right? You, you block as much as you can block, but then you, then you prepare to fail and you have a capability where if your prevention fails, you're still okay. That is resilience, right? And so the ransomware defense assessment helps you to be ransomware and multifaceted extortion resilient. That's a really good uh, measure to take, not just at, at the technical level, but also at the business level. And this ransomware defense assessment is broken into two areas. It has strategic components. So it does workshops. It has tabletop exercises. Tabletop exercise is like a role play, uh, not technical, can be done at the business decision maker level. And they, they just inject uh, information around a scenario and see how the decision makers respond, right? And then coach on whether those responses uh, are likely to be helpful or not. Response plan creation, communication workflow, holding statements. Remember, with multifaceted extortion, the victim is not in control of the disclosure. So press may become, come and ask you for statements. Right? What do you say to the press when an attacker has shown to the world that you've lost data? Stakeholder identification, right? Does legal have to play a part um, uh, in these as well? Uh, cybersecurity, insurance, it, it, do you have that? Is that playing a part? How can they help beyond just uh, an insurance claim? And then there's the technical components. And the technical components are aligned to the attack lifecycle. Yes, it's looking at the ransomware malware, but it's also looking at the intrusion before the ransomware. It's looking at, can you defend against privilege escalation? Can you defend against lateral movement? The stages of the ransomware attack before the ransomware malware is deployed. So it's looking at the problem holistically. So I can't say enough good things about this assessment in terms of both technical and business value in being prepared for a multifaceted extortion attack. The last recommendation is a recommendation that we call pre-mediation. So I'm sure you've heard the term remediation, right? Remediation means to fix the problem. And that's uh, what, in a large part what Mandian does when we help victims of cyber attack and in incident response engagements, we remediate their environment. But what we've learned is as we've done those things, we've seen that the things that we put in place to make sure the attack doesn't happen again, those things, you don't have to wait for an attack. You can put them before you're attacked as, as an effort to harden your environment. So we call that pre-mediation, do it before, do it pre. And we have a blog post and we have a white paper on the most effective pre-mediation techniques that you can put in to harden your infrastructure against ransomware attacks. And so again, I put a QR code here. This white paper is a free white paper um, that you can download. The information in the white paper is going to give you a lot of suggestions. Many of the suggestions are not things that you need to buy. Many of them are configuration uh, changes that you can make to, to harden your environment and become more resilient. So this is a great technical approach to becoming more ransomware resilient as well. And uh, the, the white paper is really good. Encourage everyone to snap the QR code, download it. Um, if, if you're maybe a CISO on the call, take it to your teams, ask them if they've done the things in this white paper to uh, harden the environment or to pre-mediate the environment uh, and be stronger against ransomware attacks. The last uh, recommendation is around validation. And so we get this question all the time from security leaders of how secure are we? How can we know? Because a lot of times the CISO say, well, we have 30 layers of defense, so we have to be secure. But how can you be sure? How do you measure? If you measured the effectiveness of your security, what would that look like? 
Well, that's hard to do, right? It's hard to measure the security. Well, that's what validation does. Validation measures the effectiveness of your security in a formal way. Remember, Mandiant is responding to these attacks. We see all the things that the attackers do. We not only share the defensive IOCs with our customers, but we can also share the offensive building blocks of attacks that they can use safely in their own environment to test the effectiveness of their security controls. And so this is called ransomware defense validation. So when you see the next new ransomware family in the news, validation will have that ransomware family. And when your management asks you, are we safe against this new ransomware family that we read about in the news? Your answer can be, Yes, we're aware of that ransomware family. We have access to it. We ran it through our production security controls and we were 98% effective against the, the ransomware itself and all the associated techniques in the attack chain that that family uses. That's a much better answer than, well, we called the vendor and the vendor said, yes, uh, our, our controls cover it. And so that's the idea of validation. That's an entire topic by itself. You can find lots of uh, discussion on validation from Mandiant and other sources. So I hope those recommendations were some good recommendations. Some of them are, are free and readily available for you. The Defender's Advantage ebook is available. There's lots of good uh, suggestions around multifaceted extortion there. And uh, with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you for the time and I hope all this information was useful. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Steve Letson. Okay, so I think we only have like a couple of minutes for some Q&A, and I believe that Mandian will also give a prize to the best question in the Q&A section as well. So uh, will you be able to select some of the question if you click Q&A? Sure. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm on chat. Let me uh, open the Q&A. Yeah, right. So there are only like some, uh, some questions that are asked in English. Okay, okay, I'm looking at them now. Mm, yeah, from from one from one p.m. onward. Okay, yeah, there uh, so, are your questions. So one of the I've got them here. One of the questions is, how can we know exactly who opens up the back door or hidden in our devices and so on? So that's a great question. So the, the idea of who we call attribution, right? Understanding who is it that's attacking me. And in the physical world, it's easy to often to see who's attacking you. But in the digital world, attribution is very, very hard. Um, you can't even attribute many times based on malware because different groups will use different malware. We heard earlier about uh, the ransomware as a service um, ecosystem. And so there are different groups, even within one sort of ransomware family. So to get to those answers is not easy. It takes forensics talent. It takes uh, cyber threat intelligence. That's one of the things that, that Mandiant works on as well. Um, and, and so that's where I would look. I would look at forensic capability. I would look at cyber threat intelligence and maybe some help from outside organizations. But just understand that attribution is very difficult. Sometimes it's not possible. Okay. Probably one more, one more questions in the Q and A box that you would like to answer. Uh, let's see. I'm scanning through them here. So, what are, what are the warning signs that my computer may have been infected by ransomware and malware? Now, this is an interesting question. Um, there's two parts, right? So, there's the part where the attacker intrudes. Often, that's invisible. Once the attacker is inside, it's very hard to see that attacker as they're moving to the servers. Once they get on the servers, though, it'll become very visible because once they deploy the ransomware, the, the, uh, the ransomware screen comes up asking for a payment. Um, so it's easy to know once you've been hit by ransomware. The hard part is to know when the attacker is doing the activity preceding the ransomware deployment in your network. That is the whole challenge of detection and response. And so the, all the popularity that you hear around EDR and XDR and MDR are all trying to solve that problem. Um, one of the easiest ways to do it is to take an outsourced approach with MDR, like manage detection and response. Okay, I think we can do only one more question. Let's say this one, can malware infect 
on blockchain or Bitcoin? And malware, in fact, on blockchain or Bitcoin. There's certainly attacks that attackers have used. You know, blockchain and, and Bitcoin are using sophisticated technology to be secure. A lot of times, hackers aren't directly attacking that technology. Uh, the idea of hacking is finding a way to go around the complicated technology. So one example for a way uh, was of an organization that was um, getting funding uh, on a website in a, into a digital currency wallet. And so the attacker, rather than attack that wallet and try and steal money out of the wallet, what the attacker did was the attacker attacked the website. It's a much easier target. And by attacking the website, they took the wallet of the company doing the funding, put it aside and put the own attacker's wallet there. So as people were investing, they were investing into the attacker's wallet. That doesn't require hacking the blockchain to do. It just requires hacking a web server. So, and, and in many cases, that is what real world hacking looks like. And so even if um, you're using a technology which is very secure, there's always some sort of side channel which you may be exposed at. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for all the answers. And also, thank you so much, Kun, uh, Steve Letzin from Mandian for your great presentation today. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day. <clears throat> ค่ะและในลำดับต่อ